Hey, good people, and welcome back to our Revelation study. We are in Revelation 6. We are making great headway through the book of Revelation. We have a whole lot to talk about today. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this. We are going to have to trek through Daniel before we get to Revelation so that I can helpfully make sure that this makes the most sense because we're entering into a new period in time that we've not yet seen in the what's not yet seen in our study so far. We've seen it in the rest of the Bible. It's not as as obvious or as revealed as it is, but we are entering into a new period of time. And I want to make sure that I, I set up the case so that you understand exactly what's going on here. Okay. So we're going to pick up in Daniel 9, and I promise we're going to make it back to Revelation by the time we're finished teaching. Uh, but we're going to pick up in Daniel 9. Now, I want you to follow along with me, okay? Because I want you to see what we're talking about. We're going to go a little deeper than we've gone in weeks past today. So I want you to follow along. Daniel 9, Daniel 9. Go and flip there. Get your iPad. Get your phone there. Daniel 9. And eventually we'll make it back to Revelation 6. So go ahead and put a pen there too. But Daniel 9. Uh, we're going to start reading at verse 24. And I'm going to read to verse 27. Daniel 9. We find these words. Chap verse 24. We find these words. 77 are decreed, decreed for your people and your holy people to finish transgression, to put an end to sin and to atone for wickedness, to bring in the everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this, from the time that the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be 70 sevens, 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, and time to trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and have nothing. The people of the ruler will come to destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with one, many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to the sacrifice offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end is decreed and it's poured out on him. Okay, so what, we, what we're seeing here is a timeline, okay? There's a timeline for, for the coming of the Messiah the first time. To the coming, to the going, the killing of our, our precious Savior, to his return. We're seeing a timeline, okay? And it's divided up in some funky little word, lettering and, and, and number uh, numerically. So, what we first have is we have the first seven sevens. Okay, so first seven sevens. Uh, during the first seven sevens, Jerusalem would build again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. So 49 years, Jerusalem would build again. Jerusalem would build again. They're going to rebuild the temple. They're going to rebuild the temple. Now you think about that. They're going to rebuild the temple because if Jesus is coming to the earth, even if that's not where he's going to lay his head, God is coming to the earth. His home needs to be in order. If he went to prepare a place for us, we need to prepare a place for him. Um, and so the first thing that we see when we see this timeline, he is preparing. There is a place to be prepared for God to make his residence back on earth. I think you need to see that um, because although God is coming in the flesh, God himself is coming as well. The temple will be restored. Restored, which means the spirit of God is going to be restored back to the earth. Okay. Now, if you recall before Jesus, there was a, a period of silence before, before John the Baptist, a period of silence where the prophets were not speaking and they were not in contact with contact with God. Um, they were, there was a whole lot of, of, of waywardness and God was not speaking to his people in that season. Um, and so I think it is a very befitting. The first thing that we see in the old Testament before Jesus even comes back, comes the first time, not even back, but comes the first time. What we see is they are preparing a place for the spirit of God to rest. Okay. First seven, sevens, 49 years. Then you got a second, second, seven, a second set of sevens which is, uh, is 62. That's a total of 434 years, which will make a total of 483 years so far. Uh, now, there is no implication of a gap in between this first set and the second set of numbers. So this is, this is successive time. This is, from, this, is, this is 483 years from the time of Daniel to, to, to what we see next, okay? Then we see 69 sevens are until the Messiah the Prince. Okay, this is a clear prediction of the time frame through which Jesus, the Messiah, the, the Moshiach, is to 
on the earth, okay? So there's a clear, a clear time period that they are supposed to be expecting Jesus. When Jesus hopped on the scene, the Jewish people should not have been surprised. They were so stuck up in vain things. They were so stuck up in vanities. They were so stuck up in what had happened or, or the fact that Jesus came and he, he was born in a manger and he was born to a carpenter and he was not born on David's throne. David's throne wasn't even in existence at the time which he came. But they had a clear timeline of when Jesus was to appear. And guess what? Jesus appeared in the timeline that he said he was going to appear. Uh, and so for the Jews to reject their Messiah was an act of hardening. In the book of Romans, we see that God says he would give them over to the desires of their heart and he would turn them over to a reprobate mind. A reprobate mind means that you're hardened. You're so hardened. You've been, you're, you, you, you don't hear anything. You're, un, you're not sensitive to the spirit of God. You're not sensitive to what God is saying. A reprobate mind. When, the, when Jesus came, the Jews were so stuck on a reprobate mind that all of the clues were pointing to him being the Messiah, but because they had expectations of how he would come. Come on, Holy Spirit. They had expectations of how he would come. They had expectations of what he would look like. They had expectations of all of, of such things that when he came, they rejected him because they could not imagine that he would come in poverty. They could not imagine that he would come wrapped the way that he came. They could not imagine that he would be a carpenter's son. They could not imagine that he, he would walk around everywhere and would have nowhere to lay his head. No, our Savior, the Savior of the world, and we serve a God who owns all the cattle on a thousand hills, and we serve a God who could supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. If I serve a God who is good, better than good, and gooder than good, and all of that stuff, surely he would come with wealth. Surely he would have great robes. Surely he would be bigger, better than we could have imagined. But that's not how he came. As far as the timelines comes, he appears within the period of time the Bible says that he would appear. It's, it says that it is, it's as clearly as Daniel could have even attempted to state it, that he taught that 483 years after the decree to build the temple, who, uh, that, that he would come. Well, in Daniel 9, he speaks of it being fulfilled. The second temple is built, and it's built, and it's not, it's not just built, but it's not brand new when he comes. He comes in a time period where they should have been aware, okay? Remember I told you it was going to get Jewish. It was going to get Jewish. They should have been aware, but because their hearts were hard and they missed it. Now, I want to ask you this, and we, I'm going to finish, but I want to ask you this. As you are thinking about what you're praying for, as you're thinking about what you're expecting God to do, as you're thinking about how you're expecting God to do it, what happens if God sends you exactly what you prayed for? Exactly what you prayed for, but it does not show up how you thought. It comes in the right timing, comes with everything that you prayed for nestled on the inside, but you reject it. That's what happened with the Jews. That's what happened with the Jews. And then... Um, there's a third division of sevens, the last grouping, the third division of sevens. It was not, a, it, now this was not immediate to follow the 62 sevens that came before here. Now this 70th group of sevens is held on pause until verse 27, all right? The text says that the Messiah would be cut off after the 69 weeks, he would be cut off. Now cut off. You know, I know we think of being cut off like, you know, I'm not going to pay you anymore. But, but to be cut off in this context, to be cut off the way that he's talking about it in the text right here, he, it, it means to have died a violent death. Well, when we look at the record and we look at how Jesus died, Jesus died on an old rugged cross. He bled. He died. They bearded him. They put a crown of thorns on him. They pierced him in his side. They didn't break not one bone on his body. And he was. And when he did die, he gave up the ghost. He died a violent death. He died a violent death. Now, but see, there's also a phrase that says he would have nothing. Now, if I looked at him to have nothing, we would say he was impoverished. 
But we could also, from the way that the Greek reads, we could say that that have nothing would mean that he was in place of. It was a substitutionary death. So he would be cut off and have nothing. What does that, what does that mean? What are you saying? What I'm saying is that the prophecy would suggest that he would die a violent death in place for somebody else. Well, how did Jesus die? Why did Jesus die? Jesus died because he had all power. He could have done whatever he would have pleased. He could have not gone to the cross, but he, Jesus died. And when he died, he died in place of me and you. He was sinless, did not have a sin problem, didn't have that problem. He was sinless and blameless, but yet he died a sinner's death so that you and I wouldn't have to. He allowed his soul to be divorced from his father for a short while so that we would never experience what that felt like. Okay? So we would never know what it felt like. So the prophecy suggests that Jesus would be the Messiah. Now, I know there are scholars out there and there are people who like to build cases all day long that Jesus is not the person they're talking about here in this text and that the Messiah is yet to come, but that is not my conviction. That's not my conviction. Now, we see, we see, we see this third inter interim period that the temple again would be destroyed sometime after the death of Messiah. Well, what happened? What happened? They destroyed the, they destroyed the, uh, they destroyed the temple after Christ was died, Christ died. And then whoever the Messiah was, I believe it's Jesus the Christ. That's who, that's whose name I pray in and do everything else in. But they believe whoever the Messiah was be, well, he would appear on the scene after the, re the rebuilding of, of, of Jerusalem and be killed in Jerusalem after the, te the temple was destroyed. Well, that's exactly what happened according to history. Okay? So we get this timeline. And this timeline would suggest that everything in the timeline was fulfilled up until verse 27. And then that leaves us this last set of seven. This last set of seven, it leaves us this last set of seven. And the last set of seven is what many of us believe is the 70th week of Daniel or the seven years of tribulation. Okay? The 70th week of Daniel or the seven years of tribulation. Now, I, I will use those two things, those two terms interchangeably. They mean the same thing. The 70th week of Daniel or the seven years of tribulation. Okay? Now, what we're about to study today, what we're going to study today in, in Revelation is not the content of the scroll. Remember last time we talked about the scroll, who was able to lose the, the scroll, and then there was one, and they went into worship and all that good stuff? We're not going to talk about the content of the scroll. We're going to talk about those seven seals that was holding the contents in the scroll, okay? So every time he takes off a scroll, off a, off a seal, something happens in the earth. Every time he takes off a seal, something happens. The, the, the makeup of the universe shifts. Every time he takes off one of the seals of the scroll, the scroll had great power. It was the title deed to the earth. And so every time he took off a scroll, something had to happen in the earth. And so today we're gonna to explore that, okay? Now, now I want you to see this. Opening the seals is not merely a declaration of what God will do, okay? Um, but it's the exhibition of purpose then accomplished. So whenever the seal is open, the sentence appears to be executed. So the seal opens, and then we're going to look out in the earth, and that's what is happening on the earth. Now, remember, we're in the balcony. We're in heaven watching down. We're not on earth watching this unfold, even though... You know, sometimes we look at this and it makes you ask the question, did Christ leave us? But I don't believe that is the case. I don't believe that's the case. All right. Revelation 6. Here we go. Now, when the se now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. He sat on it, had a bow. He who sat on it, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering to conquer. Okay, so we got a new character, new character. We got a guy riding on a horse. He's wearing white. Now, if we took what we had studied previous and what we would see later, we would say this guy wearing white must be Jesus. 
Must be Jesus. He's got a crown on. He's got on a white robe. He's got on. He's got a bow in his hand. He must be Jesus riding in the in, uh, being triumphant. We should start singing, "Ride on, King Jesus." But that is not what's happening here. Okay, I think we get the first glimpse of the Antichrist here. The first glimpse of the Antichrist right here. Now, you probably said, now, Minister Cole, how is that possible? He's wearing white. He has on a crown. How could that not be? We, 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 what we see here is first, the guy's wearing a white, a white robe. He's not wearing a diadem. Okay, a diadem is a crown that is reserved for, a diadem is reserved for God. It is a deity crown. This guy is wearing a Stephanos crown. It's, it's not, not the same thing. Okay, so not only does he have on a diadem crown, he's wearing a white horse, he has a bow, and he has a bow. Now, where do we see that in the Bible? You know, we, of course we see the rainbow, but we also see the bow, we see the bow with Nimrod. Nimrod, the first world dictator, had a, had a bow. He had a bow. He went out conquering people. Now, one of the words you will see, you will hear a lot during the study is Nicolaitan. Nicolaitan. Okay? Nicolaitan. A lot of people think that the, um, the Antichrist's name is going to be Nikolai. Nicolaitan. Now, what does that mean? Nikolai means ruler of the laity. Laity, normal people, regular, everyday Joes, the ruler of the laities. Okay? Now, but in his job as a Nikolai, the Nikolai to the Nikolaity, the people, the common people, are, is to subdue them, to conquer, their, conquer them. Now, let's look at everyday living, okay? I want us to get in our own space. Go back home. Look around your living room. Look at your TV. If you were to be conquered, but you would be, were to become a follower of the person who conquered you, how would you go about that? How would you go about that? You would, you would infiltrate everything that you learn and you see, everything that you believe. That's why, that's why when you look on TV over the last, what, 50 years, TV has gotten more vulgar and vulgar inch by inch so that we would not recognize as much. We would be comfortable with much things that we would cringe at 20 years ago. We don't cringe at anymore. We, we've gone from two people sleeping in separate beds, calling themselves married, to people having full-blown sex on TV. Oh, yeah, we yeah. are rulers of the laity. Let's think about this. Not, he's not just putting you in chains. He's not just putting trackers in you. But what he's doing here is he's controlling your mind, controlling the way that you think. He's teaching our children how to think, changing the way that they, what they learn in school, changing curriculums, making things that God said aren't okay, okay, putting people in their purview that would convince them that the way that they're living is sufficient. Making lifestyles that God said not okay. Making them seem as if they are okay. So the things we read, the TV, we watch, the news that we are fed, the leaders that we follow are purposefully put there by Satan to convince us that it's okay. And then we are made to feel as though we are not okay. Made to feel as though we are something wrong with us when we hold to our good Christian values or what thus saith the Lord. No, I'm not saying hate you, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is open your eyes and see. If I were the Antichrist, how would I rule over the people and they not even realize it? I would infiltrate their television. They don't read, but maybe I can get some, them to read something. I would infiltrate the New York Times bestsellers. I would infiltrate their music. I would infiltrate the things that they are constantly feeding themselves. Christian, this is why it's so important that you feed yourself with the word of God. This is why it's so important that you spend time in the word of God, that it become your primary source of nutrients. Because if you spend so much time feeding yourself with things that are not designed by him, your worldview, the way that you view life and living becomes contaminated. And we become okay with things that God did not ordain or design. Now, I want you to also see this. This guy is not conquering by military force. This, this is, I'm telling you. He's not conquer, conquering by military force. He's trying to conquer the lives, the minds of the people. He's got a bow in his hand. He's trying to conquer you in ways that you don't think you're conquered. You're going to stand up for things that are not right and think that they are. 
He's causing your mind and your heart to become reprobate toward God, okay? And I want you to also understand this, that Antichrist, Antichrist does not mean the opposite of Christ. No, the Antichrist is not the opposite of the Christ. The Antichrist is just as close as I can get you to Christ without being Christ. So let me get you on the, uh, on the side of sin without you realizing that you're on the side of sin. The Antichrist, you're going to see throughout this book, he's going to try his hardest to manipulate and imitate Jesus Christ at every single turn. Here he is in white with a crown on. We're going to see him trying to bring together the, the, the other face of the world, calling it love. We're going to see him doing all types of things that God did not say was okay. We're going to see him doing all kinds of things that, that God did not say was permissible. We're going to see him doing all kinds of things, and it's going to seem like love. It's going to be a ripoff of what truth is. It's going to seem like truth. It's going to have a little lie sprinkled in it. We're going to be convinced that, that the lie is the truth and the truth is a lie. Why do you think that Christians get so much hell? In the media, when we hold fast to what the Bible has said. And most of us are not as extreme as, as, as they like to make us seem. But, but it seems as though if you have Christian va values, they try to make you seem like you're the bad guy. All right. Now, I believe that this first seal is open. The first seal is open. He brings this world dictator into prominence. Now, we, we can understand the 70th week begins with the, di the, the dictator will confirm a covenant with many, referring to the, gen, the, uh, the Jewish people, many people like to wonder if the four horsemen of this chapter, Revelation 6, are, are connected with the 70th week of Daniel and the Great Tribulation itself, or, of course, history up until, until that time. Now, this initial emergence of the Antichrist um, is connected to what we know about the leader from Daniel 9. He shows that these four horsemen are connected with Daniel's uh, four horsemen. Now, what makes me nervous? This is what makes me nervous, is that we start seeing these interfaith movements start popping up, and we start seeing the Pope signing into things, saying that we're going to be cool with, with the Muslims, we're going to be cool with the Buddhists, and I don't have a problem with you or any of these things. But at any point when we start seeing preachers of large churches start saying, I don't believe Jesus is my only experience, but I, don't, I can't say that he's the way, the truth, or the light, we are in dangerous territory. These are the types of things that we'll start seeing in, in this, this context or this place. When we start seeing that stuff unfolding, like we're seeing today, that tells me that we are super duper close. Okay. The second seal, verse 3, he says, When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, that people should kill one another, and there should be given to him a great sword. Now, of course, evil is associated with red. All, we see that all the time. But I also want you to see this, is that the rider does not bring evil into the world. The rider does not bring guns or weapons of mass destruction. The rider does not bring chaos with him. All he does is take peace from the earth. And when he takes peace from the earth, men follow suit. Men follow suit. We see that happen with Cain and Abel. We see that happen with all types of things. As a matter of fact, I was watching a video on YouTube, and this little kid could have been more than two or three years old. He was, it was Halloween time. He went and patted this, what he looked like a stuffed animal spider. He went and patted it, tried to be nice, and it popped out at him. It was, it was Halloween time. It was one of those displays in the grocery store. And when it popped out at him, the little kid turned around, and he tried to beat the mess out of that spider. It was his instinct to fight. It is not the instinct of man to be good anymore. When we sin, our instinct to be good went away. There is none good but God. I know we don't want to believe that. We want to believe that we're good people. We ask ourselves, am I a good person? But the truth is that our instinct to be good is not, it's not, a, it's not an instinct. It becomes an instinct when we begin to walk with Christ. I know we like to talk about how innocent babies are, but babies come in this world clothed in sin, clothed in iniquity. That's a biblical worldview, y'all. I know we want to think that we become more evil, like the babies come in the world and they're not corrupted. Babies come in the world corrupted. They come in the world sinful, come in the world with adverse intentions. 
And so when, when he removes peace from the earth, when peace is removed from the earth, when, when Jesus pops the seal of peace off the earth, it, men do not have to be taught how to sin. Men do not have to be taught how to live wrong. It is instinctual. And he removes this peace so that men could kill one another. And I want you to just think about it. our modern age is marked with so much conflict. We spend billion, trillions of dollars as a country on warfare. Forget the world, this country on warfare. We're so, we're so obsessed with fighting and defending and causing chaos and getting our way that we spend half of the nation's budget on warfare. Warfare. But on the con on conversely, our churches are not consumed with spiritual warfare. And that's what this is. Our churches are not consumed with spiritual warfare. We're not calling down powers and principalities. We're concerned with shouting and tithing. And tithing is good, and a good shout is there's nothing wrong with it. It seems like on earth we're concerned, we're, in the physical we're consumed with fighting and warfare, but we're not consumed or equipped to fight the battles in the spirit. And we wonder why we're losing. Wonder why our churches are dwindling. Wonder where our youth are. We're not fighting the fight. Verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I, seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked and behold, a black horse who sat, had a, sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for Daenerys and three quarts of barley for Daenerys. Do not harm the oil and the wine. Okay, so we got a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hands. The, now, the scales symbolize the, the, the fact that they had to carefully measure and ration food. Y'all, we are not there yet. We're not there yet. But I will say this, with this pandemic and them talking about them not having enough meat or them not having a, uh, enough uh, of, of anything else, I, I can't tell you how many times I've ordered groceries and the things that I wanted were not in stock. Couldn't get yeast for bread. Couldn't get yeast for cinnamon rolls. All, all of that stuff. We're seeing the beginning, the birthing pangs to what is, is being talked about here. In the richest nation in the world, we're seeing the birthing pains. The birthing pains of what, what it will happen here. A, a quart of wheat for Daenerys will insinuate that they're going to pay a day's wage for a loaf of bread. For a loaf of bread. But I want you to also notice this. The verse also says, do not harm the oil nor the wine, which insinuates that the rich folks will be fine. That if you are filthy rich, you're in that 1%, maybe even that 5%, that you'll be fine. There will be plenty for those who are rulers of the laity. For those who rule the world, there will be plenty of them. They will find a lap of luxury. Now, think about this. How the, the, the gap between the wealthy and the middle class seems to be getting larger and larger and larger. They say, I was reading some statistics the other day that suggested that CEOs make 300 times what line staff in most of their companies make. 300 times the amount. We're not there yet, but we are absolutely getting close. Absolutely getting close. And it, it, it's, it's more than famine, it's rationed. It's rationed. This is not just famine. This is not stuff won't grow. This is evil, okay? This is evil. It's not that stuff won't grow. It's, it's what we see here in the earth is that the rich have no shortage, but the others on the earth, the majority of people on the earth will feel like there is none, nothing for them. There, there's nothing that they can have that they will be without, but the rich will have abundance. They will eat to their heart's content. But the poor, the middle class, will be so grossly without that you, they would be begging for help, begging for help. The fourth seal, he pops the fourth seal. He says, when the open the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the living creature saying, come and see. And I looked and behold a pale horse. The name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed him. And power was given to him over the fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and the beasts of the earth. Now, I want you to see this. The, he, the, this, this, this beast, this, this horse, his, his color was coloros. He was pale. He had the same color as leprosy. That's the same color we see to describe leprosy. Now, I want you to see this. 
that he the that the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades fell followed him so he 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 the name was death death claims the body hell claims the soul in other words that death was not was lurking in the midst for wherever death was going he was devouring people we're talking about people who are not saved we're talking about we're talking about complete chaos so he opens the fourth seal and all of a sudden people start getting sick people start dying People start losing their health, losing loved ones. And not only are they losing their health and their loved ones, hell is falling behind them. Hell is falling behind them to devour them, to keep them from safety, to keep them from peace. Now, I want you to see, see this. Remember last time we talked about a word beast, and that word beast in chapter 4 just made, made, meant created things. The word beast here is the word zoa. And zoa means living creatures that are ferocious. Now, I want to present this to you because we are living in the middle of a pandemic that when we see this word zoa, these living ferocious beasts, that it does not suggest that these beasts have to be larger than life. These could be microorganisms. This could be a virus. The beasts that are, that are, that are, that are running rampant across the earth could be a virus. It could be bacteria. Now, it could be some weird-looking animals like they describe in the Revelation later on. But it could very well be that this could be a, a, um, the beasts that are running rampant could be a virus or a bacteria or, or something of the like. It could be huge. It could be microscopic. I don't want you to limit your thinking of what this beast, this beast that's running la a rampant, that this that this this beast that has death, um, that that has death and by all of these things following him. I don't want you to think that that's just got to be some weird looking thing. This very well could be uh, a microorganism that that has carries disease. This could be HIV. This could be COVID nineteen. This could be uh, something we've not seen before. This could be some weird looking monster in the sea. It, it, the lim there's not a limit. What I'm trying to say is there's not a limitation to what this could be. And I want you to see this. Romans 1, right, back to Romans 1. I know I was there a little bit earlier. What he says is he'll give you things you demand. Well, what he insinuates, he'll give you things you, you demand. If you demand power and control, he'll give you slavery and oppression. If you demand for him to sin, uh, if you demand lies, He'll send you the delusion of the Antichrist. Ooh, we're starting to see some stuff, right? He says, if, if, if you seek to destroy, he'll send you anarchy. Now, let's look around. Let's look around. We're starting to see anarchy pop up in our city, cities, are we not? I know this is not what y'all want to hear. I know this is not what you want to hear, but I want you to think about this. We're starting to see anarchy pop up in our cities. We're starting to see autonomous zones. We're starting to see, we're starting to see things happen that seemingly are talked about right here in chapter 6 when he starts to pop open the scrolls. Now, do I think we're there? No, I think we're getting there. I think we're in the birthing pains. I think if we were in the delivery rooms, they would be talking about they got a ten, they're, they got, they're dilated 10 centimeters. If, if I had to make my guess, if I had to make my guesstimation, we are close. We are so close. Now, what you also notice is it says power was given to them over the earth to kill, power was given to the horsemen and given by God. Though all hell breaks loose, God is in control. There was power given. Power was given. God relinquished some power so that this chaos could happen. And I know that that's hard for us, the Christian. How, how could God allow? How could God allow? But this is the same God who gave us the privilege and the possibility of salvation to avoid these things. He gave us a scapegoat scapegoat you cannot expect for you to be drowning in the water and as you're drowning in the water you're praying for God to send you some help and a boat comes by and you say no I'm waiting on God and the boat comes back in no I'm waiting on God and then be upset at God when you drown he's provided a scapegoat he's provided a scapegoat because I know a lot of times we want to look at this pandemic we want to look at the chaos going on, the rioting, the looting. We want to look at the, 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 the chaos going on in the White House. We want to look at the chaos happening in the, uh, the United Nations. We want to look at the World Health Organization. And we want to say, how could a loving God allow? How could a loving God allow so much chaos on the earth? But you have to ask the question, did he provide for me protection? Did he provide for me 
a way out. And if the answer is yes, and I know that it is, if you're saved, if you walked in the rain or you stayed in the water, you made the choice to do so. Verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held, and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then with a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they shall rest a while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. That word martyr. I know sometimes we like to look at that word martyr, and we assume that that word martyr means hero. That word martyr here is translated witness, witness, witness. Now, this altar we're talking about is in heaven. Uh, it's kind of like reminiscent of Hebrews 9. The Ark of the Covenant is a replica of what is in heaven. We are in heaven. We're no longer dealing with the replica like in the temple, but we are dealing with the actual altar that sits in heaven. The blood, remember, if, as you, if you study the Ark of the Covenant, was applied under the altar. The blood was applied under the altar. So these souls that we see appear here are under the altar. They're under the altar. It emphasizes that the lifeblood was poured out as an offering to God. I said, I said a little bit earlier, it might have been during worship service, that the greatest offering to ever happen happened on a rugged cross 2,020 years ago. 2,020 years ago, on a rugged cross, Jesus Christ died for your sins and my sins. That was an offering. It was an offering. It was a direct type of what had happened year, week after week, year after year, in the temple as they brought offerings unto God. And God either accepted them or rejected them. The blood was applied under the altar. Okay? Just another replica. Again, if you don't understand the rest of the Bible, Revelation is really difficult to understand. But if you understand concepts about the blood, if you understand concepts about other things like the, the bread, if you understand, if you have a basic working knowledge of what else is happening in the Bible, this stuff is not that bad, right? I hope so. I hope so. Now, the idea of what I just said was drawn from Leviticus 4, 7, and he shall pour out the remaining blood at the base of the altar for the burnt offering is, is what we do. Now, I want you to see this. Under the altar is where the blood was applied, okay? There aren't actual people under the, under, the, under the altar. Under the blood, and the redemptive blood took their place. Their redemptive who? Their redemptive blood took their place under the altar. So their souls are in heaven. Okay, the souls are in heaven. There was a redemptive replacement blood. Remember, the cross was a replacement act, right? And since the cross was a replacement act, when we see that the souls are up under the altar, the replacement act, so, you know, that's why we, we try to live right and look like Jesus because we're replacing him as he replaced us. There's a replacement act where the souls or the blood that was applied was under the altar as they are experiencing heaven in its fullness. I hope that makes sense. I hope that makes sense. Now, when they mention these earth dwellers, earth dwellers, we are not earth dwellers. Okay, I know that seems counterintuitive since we dwell on the earth, but we are not earth dwellers. Earth dwellers are people whose home is earth. We are just visitors. Okay, so when we see earth dwellers or we see the people of the earth, or, or, the, or the, all of those stuff, it's not talking about us. It's talking about the people who are left on the earth who rejected Jesus Christ, who refused to follow him in his fullness. Okay. Sixth seal, verse 12. And I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon looked like, became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. And as the fig tree drops his, its late figs, when it was shaken by a mighty wind, the sky receded as a scroll when it rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in caves and in the rocks and on the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of wrath has come. Who is able to sin? Now, there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black. The moon 
becomes like blood. They talk about the blood moon, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Now, in the Bible, we see celestial disturbances all throughout it, right? We, we see them connect, the, they are connected with the coming of the Messiah. We see it in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, Ezekiel. We see it in Joel. We see it in Zephaniah. Jesus himself describes all of this stuff. Now, there's, there's a passage in Zephaniah. It says this, it says, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near. It hastens quickly. The noise of the day that the Lord is bitter, there, there, there the mighty men shall cry out. The day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness, a day of gloominess, a day of clouds and a thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities, against the high towers, or... In Joel, Joel 10, 11, we see the sun and the moon grow dark. The stars diminish their brightness for the day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who can endure? Now, for the sake of conversation, okay, for the sake of conversation, those who regard these, these events as history have to greatly spiritualize them, okay? They have to greatly, one example, you know, Adam Clark, Adam Clark is a theologian. He says that the great earthquake as most uh, stupendous change in the civil and religious constitution of the world. Uh, if he referred to Constantine the Great, that the change was made by the conversion of Christianity might be very properly represented the emblem of earthquake. That's not my conviction. There are people who will try to say that the things in this chapter are, are history. They want you to believe that the things that have happened in the revelation ha are not going to happen. You have nothing to be afraid of. And I do not believe that. I do not believe that. I believe that we are living in, 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 in instances where we are possibly days, months, years, or decades away from the return of Jesus Christ. I believe that this serves as a warning that if our souls are not anchored in Jesus Christ, that if we are not saved, if our houses are not in order, not to be a fire and brimstone preacher, but I think it is my duty to educate you on what the book says. There are a lot of people who are not afraid of this. And I don't want you to be afraid. I'm not teaching this for you to be afraid. What I'm teaching you is so that you will be aware. You want to be aware. You want to be aware of what the book says. We can't avoid the whole Bible, read 65 books, 65 books of the Bible, and call ourselves Bible-believing. We, we cannot do it. We cannot do it. And so what I want you to see is that, that in, in the sixth seal, it starts talking about blood moons. Well, it seems like we're talking about eclipses and blood moons more and more often. It seems like we're talking about earthquakes more and more often in the news. It seems like we're talking about the sun having dark days. We had that eclipse a couple of years ago. It seems like all of the stuff that this book is talking about, these seals that are being popped off, it seems as though we're seeing this stuff happen more and more frequently. What does that mean to the Christian? When Jesus in those seven letters says, hold fast. When he's talking to Philadelphia, hold fast that no one will take your crown from you. Hold fast that no one would take your seat from you. Hold fast. Hold on to what God is saying. Hold on to this word because I'm coming and I'm coming quickly. Isn't that what the book says? I'm coming and I'm coming quickly. There's so much here wrapped in this. We talked about the coming of the Antichrist. We've talked about cosmic disturbances. We've talked about rations, and you know what's disturbing, y'all, to me, is that every one of these seals, we can start seeing it rear its head in society. Every single one of these seals that is, has to be popped off as the lamb begins to loose the seals off, as we enter into the seven years of tribulation, we're starting to see it happen now. The Pope signed an agreement back in May bringing, uniting all the world religions. We're seeing this stuff happen today. If you are not sure, y'all, and I, I hate to sound fussy, if you are not sure that you're saved, if you are not sure that you're saved, you call me, email me, let's talk about it, let's get saved. Let's be sure and very sure. I'm not trying to go there by myself. The word of God is living. It is very true. It is, it, it is very powerful. And the truth, y'all, is that there is great power in being sure that you're saved. Great power in being sure that you're saved. Because all the stuff we're talking all about from here on out, 
with the exception of the New Jerusalem coming down, all this stuff is what's going to happen to people who rejected Jesus, people who didn't get salvation, people who did not walk with him, didn't desire to be with him. And I really don't want that to be your testimony. I really don't want that to be your testimony. God is faithful. God is so faithful. And I hope that this made sense. If it didn't, leave me a comment. Shoot me an email. My email is najones at Nineveh.org. And, and we can talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. You got questions, send a comment. Leave a comment. Shoot me an email. Let's talk about it. We're going to hop right in at Revelation 7 next week. We got so much to discuss, y'all. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. If this blessed you, if this blessed you, go ahead and share it with somebody. Share it on Facebook. Share it on, on Twitter, Instagram. Share it with somebody. Shoot it, send it a text. Send it an email. If this blessed you. If, if you got some questions, send me your, your, uh, your questions. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the revelation that you would give us a warning about the things that are to come, that you would show us and pour out to us your love for us, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, and that you would cause us to have excitement about the things that are to come. God, we love you. We praise you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Until next time, y'all be blessed.